Now, in chapter 23, Sarah finally dies. And as we mentioned the other day, she is the only woman in the Bible whose death is given, whose age is given at death. Um, in chapter 23, after the death of Sarah, uh, Abraham negotiates to buy a grave for his wife. Abraham was a sojourner. He, he was a tenant. He was not an owner. He was promised virtually all of the Mideast, but when he died, the only thing he really owned was a grave for himself and his wife. He believed promises. Of course, he received the greatest promise, which was a son. But the land promises he never entered into. Those were for future generations. And there's an amazing passage in, in chapter 23 about Abraham's negotiation for the, the grave site. And um, um, Abraham asks him or tries to make him, make him an offer. And uh, he says, no, 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 I, I give it to you. I'm not going not to take any money for this. But obviously, Abraham is not going to take it without money. And, um, and of course, the man is also pretending that he's going to give it to him because he really wants the money. And what he says in verse 15, this is Genesis 23, verses 14 and 15. Ephron, the man who owned the land that Abraham needed for a grave, then Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver, what is that between you and me? Just take it and bury your dead. But see, what did he do? He told him the price. He told him what it was worth. He said, I'm going, I'm going to give this land to you. It's nothing. It's only worth 400 shekels of silver. But when he says that, he's telling him the price of the land. And so he gives him the silver and he buys the land as a grave for his wife. Verse 19 says, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded over to Abraham for a burial site by the sons of Heth. Now in chapter 24, Isaac gets married. And uh, he gets married to um, to the um, daughter of Bethuel to someone who is living in Mesopotamia. And Abraham sends his servant to go find a wife for his son. Now here's what happens with people who don't really believe the Old Testament, whether they're theologians or they are preachers. They, they just draw spiritual lessons from the stories and they don't really believe that the events took place historically. Well, obviously, I believe that all these things really happened just as the Scriptures say that they happened. But that doesn't mean that I don't believe that there are symbolic and spiritual benefit from the stories. In other words, the benefit of the stories goes beyond simply the fact that we know what happened in history. The historical narratives are lessons for us. They're just not bare historical records and there are tremendous spiritual patterns. And there's a tremendous spiritual pattern in Genesis 24. Abraham needs a wife for his son, and he sends his servant to go find a wife for his son. Do you know that that's what the evangelist does? Do you know that that's what the missionary does? That's what I do. I'm looking for a wife for my master's son. 
I'm seeking to fulfill the full number of the bride of Christ. When the full number of the bride of Christ is complete, the bridegroom will come for her. Jesus will come. So when someone asks you what you're doing, what, what do you do? I mean, I like it when somebody asks me that because I have so many options. I may have told you this story, I can't remember. Once on a train to Prague, I said, I'm a messenger. Did I tell you that story earlier this week? I, a young man on, on a train to Prague said, what do you do? I said, I'm a messenger. A few minutes later, he said, well, the, the news must be good. I said, the news is the best, and I didn't say anything else. Then a few minutes later, he said, who are you a messenger for? And I said, a great king. He said, I've probably never heard of this king. I said, oh, yes, you've heard of him. A few minutes later, he said, well, who is this king? I said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, oh, why do you come here? We're all atheists. And I said, you're not an atheist. And then he said, well, I guess we do have to believe something. And then he said, you know, my grandmother prayed for me. I said, do you know your grandmother's prayers were answered? And he said, when? And I said, now. And we talked about Jesus. Last week in Ankara, Turkey, someone asked me, a, a married couple asked me what I did. And I said, I'm the lowest servant of the highest king. And then she said, so you serve Jesus? And I said, yes, I try to serve Jesus. Now, it would be well if someone said, what do you do? It would be well if I said, I'm looking for a wife for my master's son. That's what I do. That's what the servant of Abraham was doing. He goes um, back in the direction that Abraham had come from, and um, he was traveling with camels, and when he came to the place, to the city of Nahor in Mesopotamia, the area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, he um, he was going to get water for his animals, and a young woman uh, offered him water and offered to water his camels. And he believed that that young woman was the bride of Isaac. And so there's a negotiation. The Bible ra very rarely talks about someone's looks. But we're told that Sarah was beautiful, and we're told that Rebecca was very beautiful. And there's a negotiation with the family for, um, for Rebecca. Will Rebecca go back to, with the servant to Abraham's home to marry Abraham's son, Isaac? Um, in verse 36, the servant of Abraham is pleading, or, or he's making a case with the family of Rebekah to prove that Isaac would be a worthy son, a worthy husband who could provide for her. And here's what he says, Now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master in her old age, and he has given him all that he has. You see, everything that the Father gives, He gives through the Son. So whenever we receive Christ, we get all that the Father has, for the Father has given everything to the Son. So this is the argument that the servant of Abraham um, is making. 
Now, the time comes in the negotiation by verse 58 when, when Rebecca's father and brother ask her what she wants to do. She's heard this servant talk about his master and his master's son. Has she been wooed? Has she been convinced? Can she, com can she commit herself to someone she's never seen? Can she make a commitment having only heard someone who knows the master and his son talk about the master and his son? Now, isn't that what we do in evangelism? We try to get someone to make a commitment because we say, but I know this master and I know his son. Will you commit to live with him forever? Will you commit to allow him to take you to his house so that you can live with him forever? I'm telling you the truth about him. He is a great master, he's a good master, and he is a rich master. And so, the, finally the question is put to Rebecca in verse 58. There was a great preacher in the north of England in Scotland called Brownlow North. And he was a great evangelist, and he led many people to Christ. And he wrote a book of evangelistic sermons. And the name of the book was taken from Genesis 24, 20, 58. Will you go with this man? Meaning, will you go with Christ? But this is the question that Rebecca's father and brother asked her about the servant of Abraham. Will you go with this man? Then they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. So Rebecca leaves her family. And when they drew near to Abraham and Isaac's home, it says in verse 64, Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel, and she said to the servant, Who is he? And the servant said, He is my master, meaning he's my master's son. So she, she covered her face, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Verse 67 is kind of funny. They get married and begin their honeymoon, and it says that, you know, Isaac had been really, really sad because he lost his mom, but he found that gaining this beautiful woman for a wife went a long way in terms of encouraging, encouraging him and taking his sadness away. That's what verse 67 says. So, we have the death of Sarah in chapter 23 and the purchase of her grave. We have the marriage of Isaac in chapter 20. Four. And we have the death of Abraham in chapter 25. Verse 8 says, Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael, evidently together by this time for their father's funeral, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field that he had bought to bury his wife in, he was buried in that grave as well. Then we have another genealogy, um, the descendants of Ishmael. Now, evidently there was difficulty in Rebecca um, conceiving, not evidently, but definitely there was a problem in Rebecca conceiving. It says in verse 21, this is chapter 25, verse 21, that Isaac prayed to the Lord that his wife could, could have a baby. And, and God answered the prayer. And it says that the children struggled uh, in the womb. And the Lord makes a prophecy. Uh, in verse 23, the Lord said to her, that is the Lord said to Rebekah, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. These two nations are Israel and Edom. 
Israel descending for, descended from Jacob and the Edomites descended from Esau. One people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. Esau was born first, verse 25. Jacob was born next, verse 26. Jacob was born with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. Now, I think that medically that's supposed to be impossible. But let me just say, the whole thing is supernatural. This is God dealing with His people. This is God orchestrating the birth of nations. This birth is prophesied. This, is, this birth is meant to be symbolic. This birth is something that's not happening naturally, it's happening supernaturally. Now, um, in Romans 9, Paul talks about the fact that God chose Jacob in the womb to prove the doctrine of election. What we do is important. What we do matters. But it is God who ultimately determines our salvation. And when Paul talks about that in Romans 9, he makes a reference to Genesis 25, that Jacob was chosen before either child did anything good, anything bad, before either child showed faith or the other child showed unbelief, God made the decree that the older shall serve the younger.